When I got brought first into VCCP, it was to set up a production arm, as we imaginatively titled it, VCCP Content. I don't really know where we got that from, but um, uh, I came from a TV background, which is kind of quite fast and agile. So coming into an advertising sort of environment with its process and workings, it was quite sort of scary at how slow everything moved and the sort of, with everything that, you know, every piece of content we produced with three director treatments, with storyboards, with rounds and rounds of uh, uh, amends that were required. And actually, the first call I actually received, which I'm not sure whether I should reveal or not, where they literally received a brief and the money that was on the table, they just didn't know what to do with. No production company were going to touch it. Called me up, I was like from a TV background, I was like, fantastic, we'll make a half hour documentary. I was like, no, 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 we only need to make a 30 second thing. So that's how it all sort of started. But we've actually evolved from being a production company into VCCP Kin, which is a fully integrated social content marketing uh, digital, if, we can, if we're still allowed to use that word, um, agency with this big sort of production back end. And the, sort of, the, you know, the reasons for us sort of evolving, we've touched upon a bit here already, but as I mentioned, you know, our first remit was to produce content, and we just couldn't produce content in the way that an advertising agency was working. We just, you know, you just can't, you have to be more flexible, you have to be more reactive. And the second thing is we wanted to be a bona fide content producer. Now, to be a bona fide content producer, I'm a real firm believer. But you've, it's not just about understanding how you make something and creatively. It's understanding sort of why you make it. Um, and for that, we had to come up with a very sort of robust methodology. Now, this is nothing new. You know, all of you guys will know this. Every single production company is undercutting each other, undercutting each other. The only way we're going to survive is actually justifying our performance, and is by actually justifying our cost by sort of being able to measure our performance. And this is where the sort of, you know, having a proper methodology really comes in, where you actually sort of, you know, you know your audience, you develop a SAT strategy, you develop proper sort of KPIs, you then get into your production, you keep tweaking, optimizing, re-optimizing, and then it's all about evaluating. So at the end of the day, you can just say, look, this isn't a piece of content which looks great, but it's also done the job that you wanted it to do. Um, and it also sort of develops, helps us develop a very sort of strong point of view about content as well. And I got kind of very tired early on when I first came into advertising, just hearing this phrase, you've got to act like a publisher, which at first I was a bit like, okay, you've got to act like a publisher. But if you look at the amount of content out there, like everyone's acting like a publisher. Everyone's acting like a bad publisher. You know, I think we call, we, we've got a term for it, it's just digital landfill now, isn't it? We're just producing so much stuff. No one really knows why we're producing it. I think there's been a bit of a sort of bandwagon where everyone's like, we've got to produce stuff. Let's just keep, keep producing stuff. Um, and um, again, like we're very, very, very keen to impress upon people, and we get asked on a daily basis, look, can you produce a piece of content for this? And we're like, why do you want to produce the content? Have you thought about why you want to produce it? This is obviously an ideal scenario where we go, if we could apply this to every piece of content or every content strategy, this is great, we can't. But you really need to kind of ask yourself, because you're not going to be long term, you're not going to be sustainable if you don't actually apply these methodologies. But you know, there are principles that we certainly agree with, and one of those is obviously about being sort of always on and trying to sustain a conversation. And we've got quite a nice example of um, being always on, which is one of the first um, things we developed was uh, O2 Guru TV. Um, when we came on board, O2 Guru TV existed. Uh, and for those of you don't, who don't know, O2 Gurus was started in when Ian was still sort of quite active at VCCP. Uh, and they were basically, they were, they, I think it was in a response to the fact that car uh, mobile salesmen would just, they were just persistent pests. You walked into a shop and they would just sell, 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 sell. So O2 said, let's create gurus. Gurus don't sell to you. They will give you impartial advice. Um, off the back of that, 
and this was before our time they created Guru TV. And when we took it over, there was 999 videos on this site, and they're all about help. We said, look, come on, there's so much more you can do than just helping people on mobile phones. You can do so much more. So let's like, try and inspire people. So let's like, you know, sort of unlock the possibilities of technology. Let's become sort of champions of technology. And so we created all these like, show formats. And now this next stat is very, very interesting because I think it really proves the power of what video can do. We've got 10% click-through rates on some of our videos. So that's click-through from a video straight to a product page. So you can really sort of see, if you compare that to what the digital banner is, which I think is 0.01%, you can really see how content can be effective. And also 7% sort of higher CSI scores. Um, and so we know that people who have an, an, an interaction with a guru are far more likely to stay with O2, um, and they're far more likely to spend more money. So this is all, all, all well and good. But... There's unfortunately always a but, and we could sort of sit around and pat ourselves on the back and tell ourselves how wonderful we are, but we had to be honest, and if we actually applied our methodology, we weren't actually behaving much like a publisher. Now, I'd like to caveat that this wasn't our fault. We didn't ever have any sort of control of their social channels, so there's only limited amounts we could do. So we could, to get our organic views up, we had to partner with YouTube uh, stars, we had to, we did... Um, partnerships with sort of publishing sort of groups, but we were limited in what we can do, what we could do, and we were sort of producing videos on a sort of per brief basis. Our engagement rates well, were okay, weren't absolutely brilliant. Uh, it was essentially we were far too reliant on paid for media, and when you, I think when you're reliant on paid for media, especially for content, you do have to ask yourself just how sustainable you're going to be and how long this can last for. It's all well and good when brands got loads of money and happy to pay it. But let's be honest, if you're paying people to watch your content, should it really be out there? You know, it absolutely goes against what we're saying as content producers. And the other thing is being briefed on a sort of job by job basis, we're missing reactive opportunities. We were not art, we were not credible in that, in that way. And we were trying to become the go-to place for technology online. So if we're not always there, if we're not at the sort of leading edge of the conversation, we weren't the authority in, the, in, the, in that space. So in the last six months or so, we've been going through a little bit of a transition where essentially we've been migrating the whole model from a video platform into an editorial content model where we brought on writers, we brought on bloggers, we're now looking in the whole sort of producing content across the whole sort of O2 ecosystem. So this has been facilitated for by the fact we now have access to their social channels. Um, but we're producing one and a half articles a day. We've got planned and reactive content. We're amplifying it via influencers and on social channels. And it just feels a much, much more robust pl platform. And finally, we're starting to grow our our viewers actually sort of organically and starting to engage with them and having proper like two-way conversations, understanding more about our own sort of target audience. And if there's sort of three sort of key components in this sort of process that we're going to take out of it, one of, one of which is, is, is credibility. We've only been able to do this by becoming editorially independent. Um, before we were very much, the agenda was very much set by the brand and was also set by the manufacturers who had started funding O2 Guru TV. And while this was all well and good, if your agenda is set by other people, you're never going to be thought leaders. You have got to be editorially independent. And we produced a couple of films at the end of last year where we literally just took the brand out of it. Uh, and within two days, we had a million organic views. We then had to take the films down for another reason, which we won't go into here. But I think we, you know, we knew we were on the right track when we did that, when we just went, OK, this is, this is definitely the way forward. And the other thing is also about being sort of relevant, which is look, knowing your audience, and also about being always on, where this is this mix of sort of proactive and reactive content. You know, we've talked about it already with, with newsrooms, but it's, it's setting an editorial calendar. Um, but clearly, we're not looking like a production company anymore. You know, what we used to have was this thing up in the sort of top left-hand corner, but now we've got all sorts of SEO and planning, community management, influencer partners. Like, this isn't a traditional production hub at all. And this is where you can sort of see what a beast content is. And it also you can see why there's such a debate at the moment on who is actually best placed to produce content. You've got PR agencies involved, publishing houses, media companies. Everyone is a content producer. You know, you've got brands like Red Bull producing their own content. And, you know, and my, the concern from my point of view is everyone is undercutting each other. And 
I think this is a very, very dangerous place to go. And this is where we really have to get back to, being able to prove that your content does actually ladder back to the business and really understanding it. Um, and so in sort of to, to sort of surmise, the sort of three things I would say in just terms of sort of who is best placed to produce content comes down to one who is the most reactive. Um, a lot of this is about sort of what is your internal structure looking like? We've talked about small, small teams, yet possibly I think that works, but I think we also need to look at that sort of project versus campaign as well, because you do need people who are always there and there to be able to react. Um, the relationship with the client is absolutely essential. I think this is one place where things just break down all the time. And you can understand that you've got these fee structures where you're only supposed to be servicing a client for X number of hours a week. But always on content requires more than that. Um, the second thing is just being adaptive, which is obviously what this whole section about. And finally, I think this is just the, the key thing, is actually about being brave. And this works not just from an agency point of view, but also from a brand point of view. From, a, from an agency point of view, I think you just need some home truths. You need, to, you need to be honest with your client. You can keep going on and talking about, yes, this works, you know, put paid media behind it, everything will be fine. It's not always going to be fine. You have to be honest about this. And then from a brand side of things, I feel, certainly from our experience, there has to be relinquishing a little bit of control. This might be editorial control, or it might be control of the production and how you do things. But if you're going to be fast you've got to be, and you've got to be reactive, you have to, some of the old ways just have to go by the wayside. So I think just to sort of, if I say one thing, what is a trusted production partner? It really should just be an honest production partner. Thank you. Thank you very much.